Yossi, thank you for being here. Thank you so much, years. Charles, for uh, hosting me. The topic that you have in front of you, and this should be a kind of a, a long discussion, is Israel and anti-Zionism part one. Um, we have seen, um, and I was taking notes, since the beginning of the seminar, um, the emphasis was on anti-Semitism in its variety of manners with Charles' introductory remarks, which were mostly some historical but also contemporary within the structural uh, shifts which uh, are taking place in global affairs. We heard um, lectures pertaining to the uh, seeds of uh, anti-Jewishness and anti-Semitism. Uh, we heard uh, on the issue of uh, uh, Nazi Germany. Um, and basically, the discussion has been on anti-Semitism um, and the legacy of anti-Semitism in two major context, I will try to put it as I was thinking about it in the last, uh, in, from yesterday. One was the historical context of the loss of sovereignty, of Jewish sovereignty um, in the ancient times. There were two dimensions to Jewish sovereignty, perhaps one um, in the first temple era which ended up with the collapse of the first temple and the exilic moment of Babylon in the sixth century BC. And that kind of like shifted the whole idea of the Israelites into the Jewish people and their relations to their God and to the idea of monotheism, which was created not only God as one God, but God of history, which has to be explained. It's not that it's a one God that monotheism was all about, but the, the, good, the good sense of the Jews was that here, our God is dictating history. He is conducting history, and therefore, he can restore us, if it will be in 70 years, in Jeremiah, and so on. It, there will be a story. There is a storytelling about the world. And the storytelling about the world was that the world is moving via the agency of the Jews in its relations with God. And the corrective notion of God restoring its people to its land was essential in this story. And also in the story of minorities. You know, the <coughs> Babylonians restoring the Jews to their land is a very interesting story of allowing the people of Israel to come back and basically uh, uh, settle in their patrimony from God. And Ezra and Nehemiah's return is an essential story about also creating the people in this different fashion and separating the people and creating the precepts of Judaism into the people and discovery of uh, 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 the, the scripture, and so on. All of the stories that we have, of course, historically speaking. And then, of course, one has to understand that the Jewish return to the motherland, or to the, to the patrimony after the uh, exilic moment, and prior to that, of course, the separation between Israel and Judea, the collapse of Israel with the Assyrians in the 8th century BC, which kind of led to the dismantling of the brotherhood, the, the kinship ties, which were prior to that during the Solomonic or Davidic kingdom, what we had is the Judea experiment uh, uh, restored in a different fashion. The Jews coming back to the patrimony were not an independent sovereign nation. They were an outpost, an outpost of the Persians. Outpost of the Persians, they had kind of an autonomy. The building of the temple and the Judaic kind of like notion of practicing of the temple, the, the sacrifice in the temple, the big the Kohen, the Tafkid, the role of the Kohanim, is a major issue of the Jewish uh, uh, history that was um, without really any statehood, because they were part, of course, and Ezra and Nehemiah, of course, were, uh, 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 as they would say today, 
uh, working for the uh, Persian uh, for, the, for the Persian state, going back and forth with Ezra, how many trips he takes, and basically serving the Persian state in, initially, <laughs> and but they're creating an, a kind of like a cultural autonomy, a cultural autonomy, which became, of course, subscribed later on to Alexander the Great, and eventually what we have, and this is a very quick kind of like tour, eventually restoring their own sovereignty during the Maccabee period, which in the second century BC, all the way to the Herod, uh, the Herod period. And therefore, Jewish sovereignty and the notion of Jewish sovereignty becoming an important factor in Jewish history. And when Ben-Gurion is creating the state of Israel as the founding father, constantly harking back, every member of the Israeli IDF got a small booklet talking about Yehud, Yehud, our kind of like uh, um, journey and our, uh, our mission. And this was like to restore the glory of sovereignty. The glory of sovereignty as opposed to the downfall of exile. Exile is the key factor in the psyche of the Jews. That is, that as, 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 as some scholars would have put it, sort of like the Jews were always a cyclical kind of like, we, we restore sovereignty and we collapse and God will restore us because we have sinned against God. We have relations with the Almighty. The Almighty is operating in history and therefore is the historical God. And the historical God is bringing us back and the, 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 the restoration in the, during the Hashmonai period is in the classical case of the Jews restoring themselves, building the temple, albeit with all kind of like uh, uh, relations with their neighbors. There is also geopolitical that you heard yesterday from my good friend Uzi. We spoke about over dinner Uzi and, and Charles. So like the geopolitics was always very much present also. To what extent we affect geopolitics. The idea of the Jews also dispersing in diaspora, becoming very critical from day one. That is, when the exilic moment arrives, the Jews are not only exiled from their motherland and to be restored, but they're also, the question is, to what extent there is any normality about dwelling among the others? Not only being a nation and a state as a congruent concept, two people, the people and the land together, governing themselves, but also to what extent they define others by dwelling among the foreigners. And they have been dwelling among the foreigners for ages. In fact, they were critical players among, in the region. And therefore, when we have a revolt eventually against the Romans, what we have, it's the diaspora revolt in 117, 118 AD. This is the diaspora revolt against the Romans, which predated the later revolt of Bar Kokhva against the Romans after the destruction of the Second Temple. Always there is the story of exilic moment and diaspora. How much it's diaspora is the natural term. So this is a new kind of like a, a regular life. You live among the others, while exile is the failure to consolidate your sovereignty in the land given to you by God, the patrimony, and operating as a real politique, as a state, as a sovereign state within the system. This is a very important uh, understanding also, of course, of Zionism in that sense, because the notion of normality, of residing normality among the, the, the other nation is a big question. After the collapse of the Second Temple, after the collapse of the Second Temple, and after the, 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 the abysmal failure to revolt against the Romans, which was not such an abysmal, if you look at it, the Jews revolted against the Romans in, one, in, in 133, 35 AD. In what, in what has been the most incredible challenge to the Romans ever. This is how Roman, Roman, Roman historians are describing it. The Romans can bar could barely, could barely defeat this uh, revolt, have to, do, have to bring soldiers, you know, from where? From Great Britain. All the way from Great Britain to suppress the revolt that took, took place by, the, by Bar Kokhva. 
And, and indeed, after that, we are entering a period in Jewish history where the question is discussed oftentimes of anti-Semitism, albeit I would say that already in the time of uh, Herod and his son, the, 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 the successor to Herod, Agrippa I, Agrippa I, which was still governing in a sovereign, a kind of like a short sovereign period in Jerusalem, four years sovereignty in Jerusalem, which is the first century AD, prior to the collapse of the temple in 70 AD, we had a short period of Agrippa I, a very powerful period because of his relations with the leadership in Rome, with Claudius and Caligula, and he was raised there. And you see when there are questions pertaining to the Jews of Alexandria, Jews of Alexandria, massive community in Alexandria, and the massive community of Alexandria is perceived by the Roman kind of like as people who do not subscribe to the culture, the major culture. And when they are being attacked, Agrippa is coming to their savior, just like the state of Israel will come to save the diaspora Jewry today, and parading in Alexandria. And when Agrippa goes back, there are praot, there are pogroms in Alexandria, and women are raped, and people are forced to eat non-kosher food as, 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 as a way of punishing. And this is, to some, kind of manifestations of anti-Semitism. Um, it doesn't matter how we define it, but certainly the issue of uh, living, dwelling among the others. Eventually, of course, and we heard about that, the Jews have become the significant or insignificant other for the, for the Christians. The time of Christianity and the rise of Christianity and the idea that the Jews are uh, no longer can recover the sovereignty because they did not accept Jesus. And therefore, they have been there as a sign of what happened in the past. But the Christians are taking over. It's not Yehudisha Babasal. It's not the Jew in the flesh. And the flesh means circumcision. It's Yehudisha Baruch. It's the spirit of Jesus. This is why it's kind of like a global idea of Judaism. This is what Jesus, you know, like we always like to say Jesus was born Jewish and was raised Jewish and died Jewish. This is the idea. But this is the new Jewish, this is the new selection. And the new selection it was all its theology, made the Jews the significant one that until in the initial time was the uh, dictum, which was very much an important dictum. When Augustine had the whole idea of the dictum, al tehargum, do not kill them. Do not kill them means keep them as remnant of what happened in the past. And do not kill them is we keep them out there. They are not selected anymore. We are selected the Christian. There is a replacement theology, the whole replacement theology. And do not kill them. We'll, sub we'll subscribe also to the defense of the Jews by the popes. The popes were the defenders of the Jews against anti-Semitism of sorts. Because they kind of like until, and, and there are lots of sc scholarship about how the popes needed them sort of like to, sh to show where, where we came from, so to speak. Until this is exploding in the 11th to the 12th century. And in the 11th to 12th century, they become dispensable. And they know, we don't have any more need for them. This evolution after the, the, uh, the, the idea of, you said, from anti-Semitism to, to anti-Jewish, but certainly there is a new phase of the Jews who are dispersed all over, and we don't want to get, I, I, I deal with it on hundreds of pages in my book, what happened in the lack of sovereignty. And the lack of sovereignty is, of course, the Jews are insignificant in world affairs, so to speak. Really, we don't have even good history about it. If you think about it, the Jews have never wrote history. They never wrote history. Until the 19th century, there is no Jewish history from Josephus Flavius until the 19th century, not even one single book of Jewish history. There is a new phase. The phase, of course, is the Jews and halakha. Creating halakha is a sense of preserving the community, of preserving the community in the absence of sovereignty. To some extent, sovereignty became the nemesis of Jewish existence. Every time we had sovereignty, we led to calamity. 
Sovereignty led to calamity, to almost total destruction. So basically, the religious practices, the communal practices of religiosity, of tradition, so on, which has been developed all the way that even God was studying the Torah. This notion of the Jews in exile, but do not consider sovereignty as a mission, because sovereignty will come only in the redemptive moment, in a geulah. And Geulah comes only from God. Will become an issue at stake also in modernity in the debate between ultra Orthodox Jews who are considering Zionism as basically predating the real arrival of the Messiah. Because the Jews, the Zionists, will become active in history by the ultra Orthodox kind of awaiting for the Messiah to come. Awaiting for the Messiah. And for the Zionists to interpret modernity as an issue, sort of like we have to be active as a nation, a modern nation, was perceived by the big rabbis of the ultra Orthodox as something which was, uh, it, it was against kind of the course of history and perhaps will destroy the Jews as, uh, as they are, of course, because of also modernity. Soloveitchik eventually had this whole idea of Kol Dodi Dofek, the whole, the very, very big book that Soloveitchik wrote. My, my uncle is knocking. That is, God is knocking on history and the, and the Zionists were listening and were moving and creating the state of Israel. While the ultra-Orthodox, and this is a diatribe kind of against the ultra-Orthodox, were not listening. You were sinners against God because you were thinking that God will come by himself after the Holocaust. And he said, God was knocking in Maidanic and God was knocking in the United Nations and you were not listening. And the same theology would be propagated eventually in a different fashion by Rabbi Cook, who were kind of like hosting the notion of the, the religious Zionist, while the heroes of the IDF for him are the Kedoshim, as he wrote about them. Those who are fighting to really to bring it. It's not a matter of religiosity, it's to restore sovereignty. So the whole issue of sovereignty is becoming the biggest issue because anti-Zionism is becoming the nemesis of the Jews, notwithstanding their desires to be part and parcel of other nations, perhaps. And their desires, varying from place to place, manifested itself in variety of fashion, either because of opportunities presented to them, Van Damme and all his essay presented them in a variety of fashion, from the 17th century on, and presented to them, and, and if you look at the history of, of German Jews and the Bildung, from seven, when you have like in 19, in, 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 in 1795, the Jews are the poorest community in Germany. In 1870, according to uh, uh, the uh, uh, um, scholars, the Jews are the richest community in Germany. So there's some a transformation of modernity coming, and it relates to what we know about calling emancipation. Modernity brings back the Jews to the world as players in the world. They were, of course, interpreted as enemies here and there in history, and we already heard here uh, on, on, on Christianity, and, and of course, the, the idea of, uh, uh, of the Jews playing uh, a role in the minds of others and, and, and of course, is in, in the emergence of Protestantism and how it was perceived. But I'm talking about modernity as the Jews are moving into the world. If it's in Germany, if it's in France, uh, we know the Dreyfus affair, which we will talk about, if, 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 it's, if, if eventually it will be in North America. And the vast majority of the Jews, of course, will be residing in the Russian Empire. By the late 19th century, before the massive migration to America, remember, seven million Jews were residing in Russia, in the Russian Empire. It was all, it's, it's uh, seven million. In the beginning of the 19th century, there were only one million. So they were, they were also because of uh, new, new medicine or the issues of water, well, it doesn't matter. The Jews really were, were growing in terms of numbers. And of course, there are uh, issues pertaining to Jewish theology that evolved all these years. Jewish theology, which had yearnings for the land, which had different yearnings, which had false messiah, with all the Jewish history, you cannot do it on one leg. But it's important to understand. The, the hatreds of the Jews, of the Christians, 
which was theologically manifested and was oriented toward these Jews as the significant other, with variation, even in this country, of course. When the Jews are being restored to England after being expelled in the 12th century, and they're being, they're being restored because of the vision of Cromwell that we have to rebuild, and this is also uh, uh, the, the, the notion after the 30-year war in Westphalia. How do we build new state? This was a Christian peace. I wrote a whole work on sovereignty in Europe and Christian peace. How come Christian peace suddenly have the Jews all the time uh, 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 mentioned in Christian peace? Because the only model was the ancient Jewish state. The sovereignty of the Jewish state was there. So they wanted, and indeed for the Christians, especially for those who consider the theology that we are building a model of the new of the new Jerusalem in variety of manners. And the Jews, even the idea of Jews being restored to their land will be uh, a sign of the new redemption, the second coming of Christ. And this is until today sort of like the ideology that informs evangelicals. When the when 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 Donald Trump comes to Jerusalem and 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 inaugurate the new embassy of the Americans in Jerusalem and being called by the prime minister at the time and now Netanyahu uh, uh, Cyrus you are the Cyrus you come restored uh, uh, the main list of guests were evangelicals they didn't like liberal Jews coming they didn't like because liberal Jews kind of like assimilation assimilationist but the allies, as they are defined, and I was present in the definition, where these are the people who are like, kind of like, understand the gravity of Jewish sovereignty. Anti-Zionism, of course, becoming a disease, despite the idea that Christianity is somewhat is subsiding, that there is no death of Christianity, God is not dead, notwithstanding Nietzsche. But certainly the questions which were emerging in modernity regarding the Jews were completely different questions as I described them at length with Penzler and other scholars. First of all, the economic Jew. What the economic, the role of the economic Jew. The Jew as a social deviant. And eventually, of course, the threats of the Jews in emancipation emancipation as a way of allowing the Jews to be part and parcel of citizenship. We are all citizens and France is the key. From the time that Napoleon is enshrining emancipation in the country he occupies, there are already warnings, think about it. Already in 1808, the Catholic leadership come to, to, to Napoleon and warning him about granting emancipation, but he granted emancipation. What he does, is basically co creating the consistoire. Consistoire is the Jewish ethnic leadership to basically report about the Jews, notwithstanding the fact that they're like all other citizens. But let's keep them there because you never know how treasonous they will be. They have these tendencies. And that was the consistoire by Napoleon himself. He gets a letter from the Jewish community in Warsaw and they appeal to his emissary and say, we cannot, because once you are emancipated, you become a full-fledged citizen, regular citizen. So the big question is, you start to recruit the Jews to the military. I'm not talking about the Russians imposing recruitment and stealing the Jews in order to convert them, but you have to. And they write, the ultra-Orthodox community, don't take us, we are incapable of being soldiers. And he delays the, he delays, and I have these letters, I found these letters, amazing letters. He delays the, 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 uh, the whole idea of recruiting the Jews, and they pay money, they pay lots of zlotis to, to, because they said, don't take us, because once you go to the military, you are assimilated, you're part, you know, you're becoming, uh, it's, it's very tough to maintain the community of, 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 of the halachic life. And there are, there, there, this is a big issue. While modernity comes, and later on, the Jews were eager to participate in the German army, eager to show their loyalty to the state of Germany, eager to show that only by shedding blood 
We can share blood. Bloodshed is blood shared. And Herman Cohen, as, as much as he is kind of a liberal Jew in, in the 20th century talking about the Jewish and morality and so on, once Germany is going into World War I, eager to send the Jews into the army. Because only like that we will die for our motherland, Germany, that no one will suspect that we are disloyal. Disloyalty becoming a critical issue of anti-Semitism. Are there a fifth column? And when the Russians are moving, they are very sus suspicious of the Jews, their own Jews. And when the Germans are moving, they are suspicious of the same Jews. And they, all of them burn the Jews eventually, one way or another. Because of other charges, that they are kind of a, kind of a sect of sorts. And this is even before kind of like we're thinking about other issues of economy. Think about Karl Marx on the Jewish question. Karl Marx on the Jewish question. How did Jews represent the bourgeoisie, the disease of money? All kind of twisted from the Christian kind of like understanding of anti-Semitism. Zionism was the panacea of all of this. Herzl, who is the genius, who looks at this and say, you know, if it's, it's the Dreyfus trial and so on, and say, look what's going on here. Notwithstanding our desire to assimilate, to be part of the French, of the German, notwithstanding our, you know, whatever we do, they will hate us, so to speak. And the hatred doesn't mean if it's Christian hatred, more than hatred, this hatred, and so we have to be moving in a different direction. And their Zionism was all about the idea that otherness cannot, not, could not provide you power. You're completely powerless. You're totally susceptible. You're unaccepted, even you're completely loyal and you create the culture of the countries in which you dwell. In that respect, many people among the Jews were the first anti-Zionists, including in this country, Montague, the minister. People in England were leery when, when Balfour granted the recognition of Zionism and the idea of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Because they we are members of Britain. How could you say, you know, like that we have another place to dwell? Our mother country is Britain. It's not elsewhere. So there's always this fear. Who do you belong to? And this fear was a main motivator for, of course, for Zionists. While the promised land, in fact, during this time was not just Jerusalem, was America. America emerged as the promised land of the Jews in the late 19th century all the way to the early parts of the 20th century. From 1982, from the pogroms, from 1882, excuse me, to 1924, and you did Barsky's here, can it tell us more? American Jewry grew from 250,000 to almost five and a half million, with four million moving from the, from the Pale of Settlement. This is mind-boggling. America could provide safe haven. In America, Jews could be an ethnic group. They could practice their religiosity in an American fashion. What Will Herberg would write eventually the book, The Triple Melting Pot, how American Jews, Christian, and Catholics are all adopting America as part of their creed. <laughs> So you're reform and conservative, but you're American. There is no contradiction. In fact, we are, and eventually become Judeo-Christian tradition. And America is a safe haven. There is no attacks on the Jews. The Jews are not single out, albeit there are groups who are still cook like slam, whatever. But this is a disease that will be solving itself. And pr opportunities provide themselves. They can be Jewish, they can be safe, and they can be forward-looking mentality. And therefore, when Brandeis is taking over the Zionist organization in America, just before he's becoming the Supreme Court judge in, Amer judge in America, he says that to be a good Jew is to be a good American, and to be a good American, or to be a good, to be a good, uh, to be a good Jew is to be, to be a good American is to be a good Jew, and to be a good Jew is to be a Zionist. Here we find it. We are in the triple beautiful. You can be a Zionist, kind of a diasporic approach, you can love, but Israel and Palestine will be something 
which would be a minor experiment. Even when our Lazarov is traveling to America in the 1920, he kind of writes 20 essays, massive essay, our Lozarov who was, was murdered later on, about America, almost like the Tocqueville writing on America. Our Lozarov writes about the Jews in America. Look at this, the golden Medina, the golden state have solved our issues. Issues of security, issues of practicing our identity. No, this is really the, the modernity at its best because we found a country which is not ethnically based. It's the idea of the, uh, the very idea of the, uh, 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 the uh, melting pot. Even the notion of the melting pot and idea. You know who invented the notion of melting pot in, in America? Glazer. Who? Glazer. No. no. Israel Zangvil, the Zionist activist, he wrote a play, The Melting Pot, celebrating his life in America. And the president of America sitting in the crowd saying, thank you, Mr. Zangvil, from the balcony for representing America. The ideal of America is the ideal of the Jews. They are very, here we are. And Zangvil was the one who was also looking for Uganda as a solution, with Herzl himself. So you see, America was like, uh, and, and now when Charles is talking about anti-Semitism on campuses and the awakening of anti-Semitism, BDS, different story. Zionism will emerge eventually as the solution for Jews who could not go to America. But when Zionism triumphed, and we began with 600,000 Jews in Palestine, this is quite remarkable. In 75 years, the Israeli century has been created with the vast majority of the Jews now reside in Israel, and Israel no longer looks to the uncle of America, but the uncle of America often looks to the uncle from Tel Aviv. Quite, quite an amazing journey. And the startup nation, and the fact that what I write about, how the Jews are supposed to be global only when they live without power. Jewish power becomes most important. What distinguishes Zionism from anything else, the Jewish power. Those who rise to kill you, we kill them. We change Jewish morality. We no longer think about Jewish morality as universal morality. Realpolitik. They come to kill us, we kill them. They come to our borders, we do what we need to do. We think like a sovereign state. Sovereignty informs everything. And sovereignty in form of everything, it doesn't mean that we become pedestrian and just like people who are raising oranges and so on as we did in the beginning. We can also be global, which is a genius. We can be the high-tech nation that travel all over the world, including to Palo Alto, to build America and to be second on NASDAQ. And at the same time, we can be warriors. What an achievement. The most triumphant moment in Jewish history a Jewish state, Jewish sovereignty, that everybody who hates us, so they hate us. Israel didn't deal even with anti-Semitism to work itself out. How it will work itself out? Abraham Accords. Basically, they see how strong we are. They don't sign peace deal with us, as Uzi will say, because we are weak. They sign peace deal with us because we bring technology, we bring doctors, we bring innovation, we bring security, and we can even defeat Iran. <laughs> what else do you need? And we defeated the Arab state who wanted to kill us, and we killed them instead. Exactly like that. So anti-Semitism is becoming kind of like remnants of anti-Semitism, becoming, of course, the diaspora relations of the Jews as a minority here and there. You know, they are hated they're here and there in Paris with the Muslims coming, in, 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 in uh, 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 Islamic jihadists here. Uh, they are hated because of uh, uh, some Christian right remaining. You name it. All kind of variation. Or because of just different, whatever it is, but just biases. We have a psychologist here. All kind of hatreds can be in, the, in, the, in, 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 in other countries. But Israel as a bastion of power, how can it be hated? So of course, there were Soviet jury issues and, and, and Soviet anti-Semitism, we have a scholar about that. And, 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 and the Jews, of course, managed to get, let my people go, and Sharansky is part of Isgab. We had all movements, I cannot give you everything. But basically, Israel is the security of Israel. 
And when Israel will be strong, the Jews will be strong, especially since there is a law of return and every Jew can come to Israel. Eventually there is a safe haven. So you may have some crazy guys like Corbein in this country and suddenly hate the Jews. You know, the Jews can tell stories about themselves. What is anti-Semitism? Hating the Jews more than necessary. Yeah. These are Jewish jokes. But Corbein suddenly becomes and he hates the Jews much more than necessary. He's like visceral. It's like hatred of Jews. I met with the labor leadership just two weeks ago in Jerusalem. They came to, uh, I had dinner with them, we talked, and they are completely different labor leadership, trying really to speak in a different fashion and about shame about what happened with, with Corbyn and this kind of type of anti-Semitism. I don't say it will not rise again in different fashion. And we see, and that affects the Jews. The Jews who are dwelling, but the number of Jews who are dwelling among, not in Israel, has dwindled. In England, for example, we are numbering today at 290,000, at best. In France, we are at 400,000, at best, with many of them are Boeing Aliyah, one foot in Israel, one foot in, in France. America, of course, remains the largest uh, segment of Jewry that outside Israel, N different numbers. According to the American Jewish Committee, 5.4 million and so on. And of course, Russian Jews, Ukrainian Jews, are all coming to Israel. This is the land that is always open. Calamity will be felt in France, we are coming. Calamity will be kind of present itself, we are coming. So the Zionist creed has been indeed safe haven to the Jews. Safe haven to the Jews with the definition of the Jews as the Jews were defined in modernity. Why? Because the Jews in modernity were no longer defined as religious Jews, ultra-Orthodox Jews. They were defined, as you said before, uh, uh, on a racial base, on an economic base, indistinguishable. So they are Jews. And indeed, the Jews in the diaspora, they don't, you know, if you look at, at, at Putnam's book, American Grace, and how Jews are defined in the United States, you see, the kind of like a much a hybrid kind of concept than what it is about like what, what are the Jews there's so many uh, levels of Jewishness so to speak religious wise ethnic wise are you celebrating Passover are you mentioning Hanukkah are you having a trip to Israel oh, lots of things happening not all the Jews were happy with the Zionist success one has to understand for some it was as I said before was the idea, the, 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 the Zionist idea of a Jewish state, a modern Jewish state, with a modern Jewish creed, which means the Jews are living in a sovereign state, they're practicing their uh, uh, tradition in a variety of fashion, but it's not a religious state. There is no constitution, there is no separation between state and religion in Israel in a constitutional fashion. So for many, of especially the ultra-Orthodox, uh, were unhappy about it because they saw it as a way, but the Holocaust presented this disaster to the Jews that all of them were wiped out and were perished in the Holocaust. So there was an acceptance of sorts, but gradual acceptance, not acceptance as legitimacy to the Zionist state. Therefore, when Ben-Gurion struck the deal with the ultra-Orthodox and gave them exemption from serving and studying and so on, kind of like for him, as he himself mentioned, was a tourist attraction. Eventually, they will dissipate. This, is not, this cannot bring with modernity anything. <clears throat> this is how Ben-Gurion saw it in his writings. And he said, you know, we cannot yet have a constitution and the constitution is not yet ready because we are a nation emerging. People will come from all over the place. And indeed, majority of Jews, of course, uh, uh, today of Israel is, I don't know if majority, but large segment of the Jews are coming from Arab and Muslim countries, which were the, for whom there was no modernity in the same sense, with the exception perhaps of the Jewry of Algier. Which were, were there, they had, they had, cremier, they had like the emancipation mode when the French moved to Algiers. The, the, the Moroccan Jews did not have that. They were subject of the king. Tunisians had it in a different fashion. But the vast majority of the Jews uh, of, 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 of the Muslim countries, with some exception of Iraqis, who talked about Iraq, Uzi, uh, 
uh, uh, did not have modernity introduced to them. And indeed, if you look at the, an Israeli Jewish, uh, Mizrahi Jews, what we call Sephardic Jews, the continuum is not between secular and religious. It's not between secular and religious. It's rather the degree of religiosity. I'm more religious, less religious, all the way to extreme religious. No one is secular in the sense. You don't see Mizrahi Jews identifying themselves as much in Israel as secular, on the contrary. Traditional, traditional, traditional has variation. We celebrate, of course, bar mitzvah. We celebrate, uh, we, we, we use the uh, official rabbis. We don't go to reform. We don't go conservative. We don't go outside the community at all. Uh, but we are religious, but you know, the, the tradition is what's important. Zionism is triumphant. It's triumphed. Israel has won wars. Israel has consolidated itself. The vast majority of Jews live in Israel. Israel is the fastest growing community in the world in terms of birth rates. We have 3.2 kids per woman, which is quite unbelievable. No OECD country comes close to us. We have been attractive in many countries. We have been uh, con conducting ourselves in a fashion that Israel is interesting. We have shades and colors between the gay parade in Tel Aviv, which attracts 200,000, and Jerusalem, the city of religiosity between modernity and religion. We kind of find this kind of like a, uh, an attraction of colors, the rainbow Jewishness. And this is where <laughs> we are now. They don't deal with anti-Semitism on campuses with Charles you know what Miami has, and 20% of Jews accepted in, uh, where they were accepted once at Yale, I come from Yale, and now 6%, who the hell cares, Charles? Okay. Well, in, in, the, in, the, in Penn, we suddenly I saw the data that you showed, I know this data, and Penn it rose, right? Well, this, look at the data. At the same time at Penn, we went from 14% to 20%. And 20% is a lot, Charles. The Jewish community in America, 5.4 million out of 330 million, to have 20%, this in itself brings anti-Semitism. <laughs> Think about it. This in itself, people say, how can it be that there are only a minuscule one and a half percent of the population and have 20% in, in the Ivy League school? We know this story. I remember sitting at Yale in classes. And I was, as an Israeli, I was absolutely unaware of anti-Semitism. I'm telling you, I grew up in a Zionist home with power in mind. You know, I used to look down at those anti-Semitism. These are for those exilic people who didn't come to Palestine to fight like my father in the War of Independence. All my life, kind of like, okay, we can do it. We don't need anyone, we fight. And I remember sitting there, it was like almost in the 19th century, uh, and I remember someone, suddenly a professor says, and of economics, you know, it's all because of these Goldbergs and Friedmans and so on who are taking money. And I, what did they say? And I said, uh, I, I kind of, as an Israeli, I said, excuse me, sir, was this an anti-Semitic remark? And it was quiet in the class. I remember that, never forget that. And he, he retracted his claim. I said, I'm an Israeli, I'm not used to it, but if it is, you're an this is what I said as a student. This is exactly what I said, I swear to God. And, and the guy and, and was quiet in the class, he said, who is this chutzpah Israeli? Because we, we grew up believing that we take power in our hands. We grew up believing that all of this language of kind of like timidity, and you know, like uh, we, I spoke with my friends here in New Zealand this morning about whether we hide our Jewishness or not, we wear it with pride. We won the Sixth Day War, we won the 56th War, we won, albeit in 73 War, we went to the war in 80, we go to wars. We don't talk talks, we go to wars. That's how it is, it's power. It's power what defines us, and with power we can achieve everything, including global presence. And we will have relations with India, and I will travel to Gujarat, and I will travel to China, and I travel to the world. And, I'll, and everybody will open their doors or two, I was just in Japan, and say, wow, these Jews are amazing. And when they talk about the Jews, they talk about the Israelis. 
They, 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 it's together. They don't separate. Because they think, wow, look at this alliance. Here is the alliance. American Jewry and Israeli Jewry, unimpeachable. This is the big alliance of power. They kind of like, and then Walt and Mirsheimer will write the diatribe of anti-Semitism about the Jewish lobby. Look at these guys. They took over America. They took over America and so on. When I wrote my book, Marketing the American Creed Abroad, Huntington was trying to kind of attack me on this, kind of like about Israel, and so eventually apologizing. But we, an American Jew, suddenly empowered each other. When Ellen Dershowitz wrote his book, Chutzpah, in 1991, he said, we no longer hide. It's not Shande, it's Chutzpah. We gotta move on. Why we move on? Because Zionism is on our side. Zionism and the state of Israel showed us what power is all about. And all those people who hate the Jews, so be it. As others will be less polite in saying what so be it is. That's it. America, strategic alliance with Israel is not out of weakness, it's out of fear. Or out of fear. It's rather because we are strong. They saw us. They saw it in the Six Day War. We saw our pilots coming and destroying all the Arab armies in four hours. This is a mighty Jew. This is David. We restored David and Goliath. It's not the Jew who is being paraded as, as in, in the streets with a sign uh, uh, of enslavement in the Holocaust. God forbid. We have restored the honor of Judaism and Jews in, in, in the sovereignty. Sovereignty has been the key for restoring the, the, the diseases of anti-Zionism, of, 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 of anti-Semitism. And of course, there are the biases against Israel, the BDS. And the BDS, and you mentioned uh, Edward Said, and uh, we had like, uh, when I was a student, Edward Said came and, you know, okay, we don't take it lightly, even though Israel took it lightly. For many years, Israel ignored anti-Semitism. When Begin was speaking to Abe, Abe Foxman, the head of the ADL, about Abe Foxman came to Begin when Begin signed the deal with Egypt, the peace treaty with Egypt, and told him, Prime Minister, look at this, you're signing with Egypt. Well, in Egypt, there are TV series of blood libel against the Jews, of the Jews burning kids, the Jews are doing awful things, and, and you have to tell them that. Bingo, uh, uh, Begin told to a Foxman, a uh, Foxman said, it's a bilateral relation, it will work itself out. It will work itself out. And indeed, from time to time, it reappears. It reappears with ISIS, it reappears with the Islamic Jihadists, and of course, our big nemesis, the Iranians, who hate us in a, in, in a visceral fashion, and we have to <coughs> defeat them. And we said, we will not allow them to have an atomic bomb. Why? Because we're going to bomb them. That's what we said. That's what they say. Therefore, the big elephant in the room is what happened to us. What is the story of Zionism? How can it be that Zionism of the power that we described is going astray and the Jews of Israel are hating each other? And this explosion is raising many, many questions about the Jewish identity of the Zionist project. What will be the Zionist project? For some in the Knesset, including in the Knesset, when I speak from the podium of the Knesset, the most honorable place for me to stand, as I said in my, uh, in my, first, in my first speech in the Knesset, I was trembling, I'm telling you, it was so emotional for me to speak. I spoke about the Jewish home, Abayit Israeli. What is our Bayit? What is our home? And next to the podium, on the right, there is the portrait of Herzl, the visionary of Zionism. And when I mention Herzl, a member of the Knesset will tell me, don't mention this guy, he is an assimilationist. An assault on Zionism in the Knesset. And we have an assault on Zionism in Israel as Zionism was constructed. There's something much more fundamental that people know, they feel it in their bones. 
It's not by chance that this issues also ethnicity, Mizrahi Jews, Sephardic Jews, uh, ultra-Orthodox, the, the religious uh, uh, Zionist and many streams in the religious Zionist, including the, uh, 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 the Benkvir and Smotrich and the settlements and so on, all of these issues, people understand. These are different schools of thought and many people already. 10 million people is not a small nation. And what, what led the, 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 the melting pot happen in the beginning was as Ben-Gurion had it, the IDF, the security forces, because we all knew that we have to defend our country. Notwithstanding our rivalries, we, first of all, have an outside enemy. We have the Arabs, the Arab-Israeli conflict. We have the Palestinian. We have Palestinian terror. We have the, the, the nemesis of the BDS. We have all of them. We know when they hate us. And we know how to react. We don't hide the hatred or trying to go down. We fight. And sometimes it only waits for a moment to, ex to explode again, right? It doesn't mean that Islamic jihadists are going to sleep. They hate you to their core. And give them an opportunity, they come to swallow you. Um, the, the crazy Christian right will hate you. The leftist progressives with their notion this will hate you because of cosmopolitanism. Doesn't matter. They hate you. Now, how much they will be able to hate you uh, and, and affect global affairs? That's the big question. Do they really affect global affairs? Or the powerful Israel plus the diaspora, which is uh, 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 normalized, has been kind of like a good answer to that. So lo and behold, this is coming now to, to the point with the demography in Israel, the structural shifts in Israel. 26% of Israeli first graders, I'm sitting on the Committee of Education in the Knesset. I was in charge in the Knesset on the subcommittee for higher education, deeply involved. 26% are ultra-Orthodox kids. So where Israel is going, people are asking. Where the budgets will go. How Israel will look like. What will be the, 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 uh, the shades and colors of the home? We have a home, but how are we going to paint the walls? Are painting the walls is something minimum, or are painting the walls, maybe the walls will collapse on us, as people will say. These are big questions that will redefine Zionism itself that will redefine the character of the state of Israel, that will redefine the very essence of our idea of security, and we see it now. What security and how, where the security stops? <clears throat> Tough question to ask, and not everybody likes when question I ask, but if they're not asked, you're stupid. They always have to be told openly and discussing it with the world. Discuss it, not out of weakness out of openness to what we are, not hiding it. The Israelis, of course, and the Jews have many definitions to themselves. And they didn't define yet the final boundaries, even in the question of the uh, Judea and Somaria. And I come from a right-wing party. But we come from a liberal right-wing party as opposed to uh, 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 people who are more religious. We are, we are, we are, we are against, we, we are for more separation of religion and state. I'm not a member of a party, I'm not an activist member. I was kind of like my, the leader of the party that I served in the Knesset, Mr. Avigdor Lieberman just took me. I was his advisor when he was the foreign minister and he said, come to the Knesset. I said, okay, fine, it's an opportunity, why not? So I was not kind of an, an, a political activist was not running for, uh, but these are big issues to be discussed. And they will define more than anything else the sense of our enemies, how weak we are, how powerful we are. This will define anti-Semitism into the future. If Israel, God forbid, is weak and perceived to be weak internally, others may be emboldened. <coughs> and the diaspora, it reverberates. Because what is the relations of the diaspora to Israel? And we had the, the, the hook of the national law. Outside the state, but inside the nation. But what type of a nation this? And we have in Israel, however, inside the state, but outside the nation. We have the Druze fighting alongside the Israeli Jews 
shedding their blood, and then they are not part of the nation. And they protest. Said, how come you have passed the, the national law? Why you passed it without including us? Is this an exclusionary law? Are you a racist? I'm not talking about Arabs who do not serve by law also. Lots of questions like that. Because everything is now, I think, concentrating on the sovereignty. The sovereignty of the Jews were always informing everything the Jews have done in history. When the Jews had sovereignty, it emanates. I write in my book about the Second Temple era and the time of sovereignty, how every, everything stemmed from Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a magnet for the diaspora. Everything, Jerusalem was the magnet, the powerful magnet. And the question is, who speaks on behalf of the Jews and with what authority? Israel speaks on behalf of the Jews and with authority. You will give me one Jew, one, I'm not saying one Jew in the world that speaks on behalf of the Jews. Even Charles is not. Close. One Jew outside Israel who can speak on behalf of the Jews. One Jew. In the past, I, I used to do studies. I said, who is your Jewish role model in the, in the diaspora? So Eli Wiesel was the last one. He was also the founder of this organization, right? I saw. And Eli Wiesel, because he represented the Holocaust, the calamity of the Jews, and he spoke as a, mor as a moral Jew in the world, and Reagan called on him. Remember the big debate on Reagan visiting Bilberg. Uh, Bilberg and so on? But Eli Wiesel died. So tell me one single Jew that the American Jew will say, oh, he's my role model. Maybe Seinfeld, I don't know. <laughs> no, no, think about it. You, uh, here I give you 10 minutes to think about it. You come with nothing. In the past, you had Rabbi Heschel, Rabbi Kaplan, you had writers, you had even, and as I write about, even American Jewish literature concentrating on the Israeli side, for good or ill, doesn't matter. This Israelization process of Jewish identity has been incredibly powerful. So this is fascinating phenomenon. But, and the Jewish organization, of course, were organizing and getting power, if it's APAC, if it's the AJC, if it's all the, all the organizations, if it's uh, the, the Taglit, whatever it is, around Israel. Israel is the magnet for Jewish organizations and power and so on and so forth. Because it's tough to keep the communities intact abroad without it. It's tough. So in this context, Zionism was the key factor on fighting anti-Semitism on the past. But the essence of Zionism and the definition of Zionism into the future will be the issue of defining the Jewish people into the future. Undoubtedly, no other issue can define them. It doesn't mean the Jews will not remain in various places, will pray to God and so on. But undoubtedly, the power will inform the Jewish because anti-Semitism was really the disease of the lack of power. It doesn't mean that it doesn't come with power. BDS, we have power, they try to undermine it. When they say Zionism is racism in the United Nations in 1975, they try to undercut us. They try to bring evil, sinister criticism of Israel. Okay. I'm not saying okay in the sense that accepting it. So we fight them. As I said, we fight them. We don't accept it. We fight them tooth and nail. We fight them with the diaspora, with the organization, with help of non-Jews, we fight them. But the big question is, how do, we, how do we reconcile our own debate? What do we do in defining ourselves? Thank you for your listening.